and welcome to Piano Teaching Success Q&A. I'm Gillian Erskine and together with my colleague Paul Might, we've created this program for you, piano teachers around the world, to inspire you, to uplift you and to make your job that little bit easier as we explore our passion for teaching piano. Well, before we get started, I just want to take five seconds to let you know that we will be launching the studio membership for piano teachers in the fifth, on the 15th of March, 2021. We're going to, we were going to open a little sooner, but we want to make sure we've got everything just right for you. So make sure you pop on over to pianoteachingsuccess.com and join the waitlist so we can make sure we get you an invitation. Well, we're so excited to be here today with our special guest. And if you're with us live, make sure we'd love to welcome you. So make sure you put in your chat over there uh, where you're from. The chat button's down the bottom of your screen. So just click on that and then you can say where you're from because we have piano teachers around the world and we'd just love to welcome you. Thank you. Well, let's get started and introduce our special guest. <laughs> Rebecca Wilson joins us from Hamilton, a little place on the North Island of New Zealand, about one and a half hours drive south of Auckland, New Zealand, which is New Zealand's most populous city. Before studying music and completing her ATCL teacher's diploma in, with Trinity College London, Rebecca had already gained a bachelor's degree in uh, computer science. Gosh, Rebecca, that must, there must be a story in that. What happened? <laughs> <laughs> well, I found my way to music teaching in the end, so all is well. <laughs> <laughs> well, it sounds like you got some valuable skills there doing the computer mm. science degree. <laughs> About 10 years ago, Rebecca began to create her Wilbex Music Theory resources and the Easy Note system, which are now sold in New Zealand, Australia and the US to help her students learn to read music more effectively. Piano teachers list getting students to read as one of their greatest challenges. And today our show will be a mas in a masterclass format to look at how Rebecca, where Rebecca will just share her thoughts and ideas on how she gets her students to read. So welcome, Rebecca. Thank you. It's great to be here. Yeah. And I'd like to welcome also Diana from Springfield, Missouri, and Patricia from uh, Lake Forest uh, in SoCal, and uh, Jan from Port, uh, Fort Worth in Texas, and from Karen, uh, Karen from rural South Australia, <laughs> and James from, well, Manilis, I think, New York. Oh, Sarah, Sarah Cuse and Jeanette from Brisbane. Oh, South California, I meant. Sorry, it was South Cal. That's Patricia. Thank you, Patricia, for watching. And thank you, everyone, for watching. So if you are out there, it's just so lovely to have so many American visitors with us today. Welcome to you. Mm -hmm. And also welcome to other everyone else, because we know we have um, piano teachers from Asia and around Australia as well. Oh, Helena from Central Coast, New South Wales. Ginny from... San Antonio, Texas, and Marilyn from Seattle. Oh, we've got so many American visitors. Thank you so much for watching. <laughs> <laughs> it's lovely to have you here. <laughs> well, before we kick off though, let's look at your lovely studio there in Hamilton. So I took this a few days ago. Um, this is my house. <laughs> yeah. And I, my piano is just in the corner there. I like to have it there um, in the family room because then my family, you know, jump on and play the piano because it's not away in a back room somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, what a beautiful outlook to all those lovely <laughs> trees. Yeah, we, we live in a gully, so it's, it's really nice. Lots of space yeah. around us. Yeah, and I see the fireplace in the corner because it does get a bit cold in New Zealand, doesn't oh, it? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you don't get snow there, do you? No, no, no. It's, it's quite mild, yeah. We get a lot of rain. <laughs> <laughs> well, hence the greenery, I guess. <laughs> kind of everything. So how much, um, how many people live in Hamilton? What's oh, my goodness. I think it might be about 150,000. Oh, it is a little place. <laughs> Big for New Zealand. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, and so, Rebecca, you've been quite entrepreneurial in taking on two assistant teachers to work with your young beginners. So tell us about that. Yeah, so, well, they're both 18 years old. Um, I've taught them both. And, um, uh, yeah, I started with one, Emma, and um, I supervised her um, for a few years. And then now I feel like she can just teach those beginners on her own. And when they get up to about grade one or two, she'll pass them to me. I'll take them take over. And so I, 
I have done the same with Olivia. It's going really well. So about half of her lessons I supervise and the other half um, she's in another room and um, the parents get to choose. <laughs> oh, this is the other room? <laughs> yeah. And uh, what, is, what are those boxes in the background uh, there? The room. <laughs> <laughs> there's Olivia the room doubles as my warehouse so that explains all the boxes that's all the world Works product yeah that's fantastic yeah Thank you. and um we'd also like to uh, welcome Kathleen Lawler from Adelaide Kathleen we've got your uh question later in the show that we'll be asking um and Christine Christine from Auckland in New Zealand welcome Christine <laughs> nice to have a fellow New Zealander on board with us today well, later in the show, we're going to see Rebecca work with Chloe, who is actually one of the young beginners being taught by one of your assistant teachers, mm. isn't she? Which yeah. is pretty great. Well, let's start with a question from Jeanette Burge. I think Jeanette's also mm. with us today, who lives in Brisbane, Australia, who says, even though I teach reading by landmark notes and intervals, I still have students who are coming from school with mnemonics and it slows them down. I'd really like to know how to overcome or work with this. Rebecca, what do you have there? Yeah, so, okay, I've been thinking about your question, Jeanette, um, and I just give you my suggestions as a fellow teacher. Um, so, yeah, when I, you know, I think you just need to assess them case by case. And, um, by the way, I do agree that mnemonics do cause them to read slowly most of the time. Um, but, yeah, I think if you have some that are reading pretty well, then you could just take some time each lesson just to try and strengthen, you know, with flashcards and uh, you could try doing some hands-on activities, you know, getting them to put the notes in the right place on the stave and on the piano. Um, and, um, but if you um, have someone who's really actually really struggling to read music, you might just decide, and which I have done before, okay, I think this one needs to learn another way because mnemonics is not working for them. And um, so I would just make it a priority, maybe for the next six months, put five to 10 minutes of lesson time aside to really address this because being able to, to you know, instantly know what the notes are is really important. And I think it's really helpful just to break it down for them rather than just trying to do the whole stave but like teach them like a beginner like where you break it down into hand positions so you could just concentrate on the c position notes and then you could um, like grab a beginner book you know because the beginner books are often laid out in, in hand position and and so in that five to ten minutes lesson time you could just get them doing some sight reading from the beginner book um, and then, you know, once you're satisfied, they've really got those notes, you know, you, you can use the same um, techniques of hands-on activity, flashcards, you know, lots of sight reading. I think you'll find that um, it starts feeding into the rest of the lesson and the rest of the music they're playing. But yeah, then you can go on to G position and you can, um, you know, do low G position. Then you can um, get them going up to high G position. Um, and just really focus on, you know, those 10 notes at a time and pra practice playing them, practice sight reading them. So I think, yeah, just breaking it down for them is really helpful. Um, and yeah, you, uh, the outer ledger lines, um, well, you're going to see me teach the outer ledger lines to a, a six-year-old later. They're really, they pick those up really easily through stories. Um, um, but yeah, that's what I would do. And yeah. Um, you could just carry on with the sight reading, you know, progressing through those beginner books for a while, or you might feel like, you know, after six months or so, their, their reading is benefiting from that. But yeah, I think breaking it down for them is helpful. Yeah. Yeah, I guess it depends on um, how advanced that student yeah, is, well, are, isn't it? Because, well, um, yeah. And whether you want to use, just go and start to use a storytelling approach and study yeah. with a different sort of system. So but you, could do, you could do the same thing with her landmark notes and intervals approach as well. Yeah. So. Yeah. So, well, let's kick off by showing uh, another way, which is quite creative and interesting that you've used or that mm -hmm. your teacher that you use um, uh, to teach Chloe, who's six uh, with her reading. So tell us a little bit about Chloe. We've got some footage oh, to show. Okay. So... 
Chloe is six years old, as you said, and um, she started in February this year. She was five then and she turned six in July. Um, so in spite of lockdowns and everything, she's actually progressing really well. Um, and she's now up to Alfred's, so she's done all these um, books and she's now up to Alfred's prep course level D. Um, she's not my student actually, she's Olivia's student. Um, and the two of them are also working through easy notes, which I, you'll get to know this by the end of the session. Yes. Uh, they're, half, they're halfway through and Chloe really, really knows 24 notes, basically three octaves of notes. Mm. Um, and this is just really causing her to eat, read music easily and progress really, really well. Yes. So um, I'd just like to say that I began this video by doing lots and lots of note testing because I just wanted to show you all that this little girl has really got it. Uh, but, you know, in a real lesson, I wouldn't spend all that time. Just just a little bit of revision and then on to the next notes. Mm. But, yeah. So, yeah, well, Chris, uh, you'll see in a minute that uh, yeah. Chloe really does know her notes. She <laughs> knows them on the stave, she knows them on the piano, she can match them from the stave to the piano, and it's pretty impressive, I have to say. So let's see Rebecca and Chloe in action. Chloe loves to put the magnetic characters in the right place on the stave and on the piano, so we're going to do that for you now. So turn around and put them all in the right place. Good girl, everything's in the right place, that's great. Okay, so can you put these on the piano? We'll just mix them up a bit. Put those on the piano. Awesome. Yeah, and just put the notes on the piano. Mix them all up. Good girl. Awesome. And where does Dufty go? Yeah. How about where does dad do go? And how about frog? What about frog? Oh, you're yeah, a good girl, froggy. Yay, awesome, good job. Well done. Hey, let's take them all off. You take the base ones off. So, how about I'm going to put some buttons on the stage and you play them on the piano. Okay, ready? I have to say <laughs> and just so, uh, so you do know yes we did fasten it up you know, during little bits of time just to sort of get through the video and, and so because you get the gist of what we're doing or what Rebecca's doing there let's unpack that a bit Rebecca um yeah so how do you mean let's <laughs> well so Chloe can what are the skills that Chloe has just demonstrated there yeah so well as I mentioned to, was it Jeanette? Um, yeah, I've taught her in a way that, um, you know, just focusing on a, a small number of notes at a time by hand position. And um, we're about to find out how I've done that and why it's worked so well for her right from when she was five. Um, but yeah, now she's just very competent, knows those notes um, really well. And, and then that just enables us to carry on with the rest of the lesson and she can just read her music yeah. really well. 
So in the first one, when you were um, giving her the buttons, because you tell a little story with each one, we'll get onto that in a minute. Mm. She was actually, you said, well, show me where Frog F lives. And she mm. was just putting all of those buttons on there, wasn't she? Yeah. And then I think you were saying, then you have, uh, you, your stories also go to um, involving mm. the piano as well. So then yeah. she was able to go transfer that that F, Frog F or whatever it is goes down, that one goes there, that one goes there. And it was interesting that she wasn't really, even though you've taught her in maybe hand, hand position, she didn't need to rely on, um, uh, you know, that one's a one above, one above, one above. Mm -hmm. um, it's she went she just knew every single individual note all in kind of random yep yeah so yeah she just is able to instantly recognize the notes on the sa stave and on the piano and she has a very strong connection that's right and we could see for each buttons. individual note yeah yes. and we could see that with the buttons as well when she was mm -hmm. able to put the buttons up and she was able to uh, instantly put that down mm -hmm. as yep. well and then we saw it uh with flash cards, flash cards. Yes, yep. same skill, I guess, the flashcard yep. skill. Yep, yep. But and she, can do, she can do those flashcards at home with her mum as well. So that's, that's another thing she can do to strengthen those connections. Yeah, good. Yeah. So let's move on and look at the underlying um, pedagogy you use with the Easy Notes range. So she's been doing your Easy Notes range and your Easy, Easy Notes books are two books, aren't they? These book Yeah, range. that's right. And therefore... The first, really the first year of piano teaching. That's right. Essentially. And by the time they finish those two books, what do, would it be four octaves of notes they would know? Yeah. So I've, in the second book, I'll just show you, there's a little chart. And yeah, by the end, they know all those notes from low C up to high C. Yeah, terrific. Mm. Well, you say story, um, storytelling is a key component, as we see with these beautiful little characters in, uh, in your books. And I just love the stories you've created. Can you, uh, and you say stories are like a Trojan horse. Can you explain what you mean by that? Yeah, so, um, you know, I'll go, I'll go back to when I was a, a beginning to teach music and um, the frustration I was running up against because I really wanted, I really wanted my students to be good music readers, but I was teaching them with uh, mnemonics. And I just found um, they were quite slow music readers and some really struggled with it. So I, I remember asking my mentor teacher, how can I get my kids to be good music readers? And her answer to me was, get them reading lots of music and then they will be good music readers. But in a way she's right, but I was just frustrated because I could never get them to get the momentum I knew they needed to, to be able to come become good music readers. So and I really started feeling something's missing here. There's a tool that's missing to enable them to do that. So I started up making, started making up stories. And so like one of the stories I made up was um, about this note on the middle of the stave. I remember being with a student and, and I'm like, okay, the note on the middle of the stave, imagine that you are snug and cozy. It's a, snug as a bug in a rug. So I told her a story. I said, this little bug one day was really cold and he wanted to warm up. So he crawled into the very middle line of the stave because there he was as snug as a bug in the rug. And um, I found that she just connected with that. And when she saw a note there, I had to, I reminded her a few times, but she just got it. And she was able to recognize that one note. So then I went a bit further and connected it to the piano. And so, um, I said, this is a lily pad with three black stripes. And I said, on the piano, there's a pond here. And we put the lily pad on and I said, when Buckbeak gets really warm, a little bit too hot, she flies down and sits on top of this lily pad, enjoying the sunshine. But watch out Buckbeak, there's a frog, frog F hiding under the lily pad, hoping to catch a tasty treat. So um, with that story, you can see she's now, she knows where the note is on the stave. She knows, you know, it flies down and sits here on top of this lily pad. So she knows the note, that note on the piano as well, and she has them both connected. So, um, so I would, I just kept going and continuing that story to include the four octaves. Um, I um, said that the treble stave was treble stave street, and this is girl G's house, this is a magnet. And the base is base day farm. Here's a magnet showing the farm. 
And then um, we just made this big, like a Google map right across the piano. Um, and we gave meaning to all the, the sets of three and two black notes. And they just get to know that note and they know where all the notes live. And they've learned them one by one on the staves. And what I found is it just took a bit of repetition, a bit of practice. And then we didn't need to think about bug B anymore. They just knew the note. So it's really powerful. Um, and then once they knew the notes, I was able to have students that could read music easily and progress well. So my studio today is completely different to how it was back then because now I've got lots of kids progressing well, reading music easily and just really doing great. So you mentioned about how stories are like a Trojan horse. Um, so, you know, everyone loves a story. We all like watching a movie or reading a book or watching a TV program. It's all stories, you know. Our whole life's a story when you think of it. So stories have a captivating power, you know. Like you imagine yourself at a noisy wedding reception and someone starts telling a story. Shh, everyone just goes quiet and they're drawn in. So that's called the hush. And I love it when I tell stories to the kids. They might be fidgeting. And then when I start telling a story, they just listen. So that's called the hush. And what happens, like they just open up their minds to what you're telling them. So imagine the citizens of Troy, they're under siege. They have their gates of their city locked tight, which is what our students are like sometimes. Um, but they, the, you know, the uh, it was the Greeks, they put the Trojan horse outside and the citizens were like, oh, look at this gift, it's lovely. So they opened up their gates and they pulled the Trojan horse in, not knowing that inside were some of the Greek soldiers who then just opened up the whole city and then, you know, the rest is history. Um, so when you tell them a story, it's like that. They open up their hearts and then you are able to put into the story what you want to teach them and it just goes right into their minds and it, they just assimilate it. So, um, yeah, that's, stories are very powerful because they're, they're really captivating. They have a captivating power and then you're also able to teach with them and just really impart what you want to teach mm. to them through the stories. Yes, I can see that um, the, it's like a world. You've created almost a world, <laughs> a world that involves not only the staves but it also unites into the yeah the they love it and chloe's mum told me last night that she has taught her three-year-old brother some of the stories and he <laughs> he now knows from b up to g on the piano because chloe has taught him so they do love it and they really enjoy well, i mean hey kids we've been telling kids stories to our kids since they were little you know so stories are just a real natural way for them to learn and to just to take in the world and take in you know learn you know yeah absolutely well Jeanette no, Jeanette loves the storylines <laughs> you've got a convert there well let's look at um learning styles as well so that you know you what you've created around what you've done is quite a very robust pedagogy um so let's look at the learning styles so the inclusion of visual auditory and kinesthetic yeah. or okay, so I'll just open up to the bug B page and we'll use oh wrong book hang on a minute um so you know I've told the story and um, you can dress it up, and make it a bit more exciting. And so, you know, they're listening to the story. And if you're really telling it in a really engaging way, they're really going to take it in. Um, also, another thing is you can remind them uh, when you see the note, you can remind them of the story. You can say, who's snug on the middle line? So that's auditory as well. And then eventually I find you only need to say who's on the middle line. And they, they go, oh, bug B. So because of the story, you, you have prompts, you know, that you can prompt them with. Um, it's very visual, you know, here's the bug B magnet with bug B on it. And the stories in the Easy Notes books, they all have um, pictures and here's bug B on the, on the piano. So, um, and they take this book home with them. This is a theory book, they do at home and they can just, you know, if you assign page 17 to them, they're reading the stories again, looking at the pictures again. Um, but in, in the lesson, if you know, if you have a, a stave and some magnets, you can do the hands-on activity. Hands-on activity is very powerful. Um, they say that all children benefit from hands-on activity. It allows you to just uh, interact and like just with the, you know, with the content and it just allows your brain to just organize it in your mind. So hands-on activities are really good. 
And then another uh, learning style is read write. So of course, you know, these are theory books, so they can practice naming the notes, drawing the notes, making those connections from stave to piano. Um, yeah, so, um, so I just, I don't like to sit down with every child and go, oh, you're visual or you're audit auditory. No, I just throw all the learning stops styles in a big pot serve it up to everyone and I know it's just going to benefit everyone because they're learning the same thing but through all the different channels and yes. it just seems to really enable them to grasp it really solidly yes um, mm. yes we definitely found the same thing that mm. by, in, um, by engaging all of the senses every for every mm. child by engaging all of the senses the learning is uh, much stronger Mm. So um, how do you, and what about learning by association from the known, yeah. from the known to the unknown? Oh, gosh, didn't, is that what you learned? That's what I learned when I was doing my ATCL and LTCL teacher diplomas. Ah, yeah, yeah, from the known to the unknown. So association is another powerful thing. And, you know, all these stories have an association and you just weave the story around it. So imagine you meet, like we can use, when we meet someone, say you meet a guy and he's really tall and you think, and his name's Jeff and you think, I'm going to forget this guy's name and you go tall and then you think of a giraffe giraffe Jeff and so you know he's tall that's from the known you make this association it's a giraffe and then it links you to the unknown which is his name Jeff and so next time you see him you'll probably have that image of the giraffe pop in your mind and you'll be able to you'll be able to go oh well you, you remember oh he's tall that's right giraffe that's right Jeff so um it's kind of it, um, they call associations and stories knowledge organizers. It just gives your brain a framework in order to, like a library shelf. And so when you want that thing, you can just go back and you can find it. Oh, thank you. So, um, you know, if you don't make up any kind of um, idea like that, it's kind of like throwing all the books on the library for, floor and hoping you're going to be able to find them from a big pile. You know, that's what our memory can be like. <laughs> so, um, but if you just take a bit of deliberate action, just to make a nice tidy library shelf, you can really learn and retain a lot really quickly. Mm -hmm. So um, we saw that in the bug bee story, it's an association. What do we know about the bug bee note? It's on the middle line. And then we go, oh, snug on the middle line and bug bee, and that leads to its name B. So, um, you know, I was teaching, uh, I was with Olivia teaching a really young little boy. He actually started when he was four. And we had a few minutes left in the lesson. I turned the page and I could see, oh, he's going to learn forte and piano next week. So we had a few minutes left. I thought, I'll tell him about this. So I said to him, see this F. This F is like fireworks. Is fireworks loud or soft? And he said, loud. And I'm like, yeah. So when you see an F, it means play loud. And then I said, see this purr, um, see this P. And he said, yeah. And I said, it's like a cat's purr. So when you're patting a cat and it purrs, is it loud or soft? And he said, soft. So that was cool. And we finished the lesson. He went home. A week later, um, when I turned the page, I remembered I told him that, those stories. So I said to him, I pointed to the F and I said, oh, what does that mean? And he said, loud. <laughs> and I said, and what does the P mean? And he said, soft. And it just like, oh, wow, well, that is the power of learning this way. He probably hadn't thought about it for the whole week, but there it was on the library shelf, ready for him to retrieve. Wow, exactly. Yeah. Uh, Helena asks, what age range would you use these for, like age six to 11 or older? Yeah, so, well, I I like, I think of it more of what stage rather than what age. It's really, really, really good for beginners because um, right from the start, they're learning to instantly, you know, recognize the notes based on their position and they're, they're not counting up anything or, so they're just getting used to doing that. And also when you start with beginners, you really see its power because they're able to progress so fast and they're able to read music so easily and then they just keep going and going and going and going and progressing so well because you know the stories enable them to play and then it's the playing of the music that causes them to grow and I, it's just so exciting I just love seeing their progression mm -hmm. yeah um but um, so most beginners are at primary school you know under 11 as you say but yeah I have used it with as young as four 
Uh, Chloe's teaching her three-year-old brother, but he's probably better. <laughs> uh, like one of my assistant teachers started a four-year-old girl and then passed her to me about two years ago, and she's seven now, and she passed her grade three with 89%. So um, I think you can start them young, you know, uh, and they just are able to progress really well. And then by the time they're seven, they're just so much further ahead than if you waited till they were seven till they started. Mm -hmm. um, I also teach at a high school, just, you know, piano teaching, and, and I'm not afraid to use it with the teenagers. Um, so if they're begin beginners, definitely use this. Now, I'm not going to get as excited about the stories, and they know what I'm doing, but they still like it because it, they know it's empowering them to do to play music and that's why they're there um, but I also I I also might use it yeah if, if some of the teenagers are struggling and, and yeah I might just give it to them kind of in a remedial kind of way but yeah most of them are primary you know under 11 because that's where most of the beginners are oh. <laughs> yeah that's true yeah. isn't it and um, Christine asks, do the magnets and the magnetic pictures come with the books or do you buy them separately? Yeah, um, okay. Well, this is how the magnetic stave comes. And um, you can buy it as an Easy Notes kit. So if you order it or you know, buy an Easy Notes kit, you will get the magnetic stave, which comes with um, the buttons and it comes with a whiteboard pen. So in itself, it's really versatile. Um, with the kit, you will also get both of the Easy Notes books, which take about a year to get through and teach four octaves of notes. Um, you'll also, okay, wait a minute. You'll also get all the characters. I think there's 31. Um, they cover four octaves and with a few overlaps in the middle. Um, and then you'll also get the house and farm magnets and ledger lines about 12, I think. These ones are thinner because you want to be able to put the magnets on top. So that's why I've made the ledger lines thinner. Yeah, so you can buy all that as, an, as a kit, yeah. So you're getting your, but the children really need their own books as... Um, yeah, the, they do need, and like some of the parents have bought a kit as well, especially during lockdown. I, mm. Some of the parents wanted a kit because then we can do it, you know, on yes. Zoom and they can, they can use it at home. Oh, uh, yeah. So the kits aren't all that expensive. I mean, I think a kit is 120 Australian dollars, and yeah. the US it's less than 100, I think, isn't it? What's the US price of that Easy Note kit? I can't remember. I'm sorry, I have to look. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but it's not. It's it's not like 300 dollars or something. No, no, no. They're yeah. Very um, well. But yeah, definitely, I think it might be about. 70 but i'd have to look yeah, um, you like can that. choose whether to have a large stave this one's a large stave mm -hmm. you can have a kit with a large stave or a smaller one and i actually really love the small stave i'll just show you because i can just pop this in my music bag and go to school it's they fold it's not a lot smaller um, the spaces between the lines are the same so all the magnets work with both just got a smaller area between the treble and the bass um, and on the back, it's blank, so you can, that's a versatile workspace. Um, oh, I, I was going to say, a guy said the other day, oh, they look really flimsy. He was looking on my website, and I just want to say, they are not flimsy. No, they no. are really solid. And yeah. I've been using this for a year and a half. It's showing no signs of wear, so I'm really thrilled with these. They are awesome. I love them. Yep. And yes, Helena, they are available at Black Rock Music. And we've got a special 10% um, off if you spend more than $100 on, um, on putting the things together because we have the individual items available separately or you can buy the one kit with the large one. And this is the large one. And um, I'm just thinking, are these books A4? No, that I took the American size. US letter. Oh, mm. Letter, yeah. That just gives you a bit of an idea about what they are are in terms of um sizing wise so that it's quite a yeah it's bigger than a3 i imagine this this board is it i imagine it is <laughs> i should find it out i don't know <laughs> not sure so and for our us friends yes it is in uh wilbex.com wilbex is where you can get all of these mm. books from 
Well, we can engage and motivate our students to play pieces too. And here's Paul with a parent talking about how whole body learning has helped her keep her child engaged in motivated in learning music and how you can learn about using whole body learning with your students. Here's Paul. We all know the challenge of keeping our students over the long haul, trying to spark their interest and get them to practice even when they are doing a hundred other activities. And we've got to keep them going at high school when there's more homework or when they don't want to play what you want them to play. It can be a real challenge, especially around exam pieces. And the parents do like the exams, but the kids want it to be fun. I want to share a chat I had with one of my mums about her son, Charlie, who's 13 and just finished his grade six piano. Charlie's been in my class at Forte School of Music since he was about five or six years old. That means he has always learned using a whole body learning approach. I was surprised that while his mum doesn't play, she really picked up on the benefits of learning in this way. Do you think that was really weird, all that movement and the singing stuff that we were doing? I thought it was different. Mm. I wouldn't say weird as in bad weird. Mm. I thought it was really interesting mm. that um, this music class was teaching singing as well. Mm. Not, not, not teaching the singing, but utilizing the mm. singing to teach mm. the music. And um, I thought it was great. I thought the it, it made sense to me with mm. moving the different parts of your body and so mm. remember that part you, you know moving the different parts of your body fires different parts mm. of your brain mm. Mm. and i still remember that when he wakes up in the morning and i sometimes say if we have a little bit of time you know go do some piano because i feel like it will fire his brain mm. Mm. Um, in the ways that you want normal to activity yeah yeah. The, yeah so um yeah looking back i thought it was i thought it was great too because when you're coming from a day of school and they're little and you know, they, they have to, if they're good kids, they listen to their teachers and they spend all this time concentrating and doing the right thing. And then to come to a piano class, um, to a music class at the end of the day, you know, you want that movement, you want that fun and playfulness. And so, you know, happy you having them, I just do remember this, getting down and playing as if the floor were the piano mm -hmm. and then getting up and changing pianos. Mm. I did find that weird, but then it, when I realized how happy they were to do it. Mm. Well, thank you so much for your time. Oh, that's all right. I thank really you for it. the many years. <laughs> yes, it's been fun. Well, <laughs> well, now that he's taller than me, it's like, yeah. <laughs> I know when like, it's, it's like, I know we're going to be teaching them a long time is when they're taller than me. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things I wasn't expecting was when she said that after a day at school, the last thing Charlie wanted to do was focus and concentrate some more. That got me thinking that in traditional piano lessons, we are asking these kids who have been at school all day to focus and concentrate some more. No wonder it's hard going sometimes. One of the reasons whole body learning has worked so well for us over the years is because it's so interactive. My students bound in and out of classes with energy and enthusiasm, and the lessons are a pleasure to teach because it just makes sense to engage all the senses while learning. And you know what? I always leave at the end of the teaching day on a high. Now, we're going to share the secrets to how you can use whole body learning in your studio to engage and keep your students. Not only are we going to show you how to do it, we're going to do the hard work for you by giving you access to our teaching success guides, which contain step-by-step -step teaching plans and videos for standard piano repertoire, like Bergmüller Studies, Children's Bark, Mozart's Nanerl's Notebook, and of course, some fun contemporary pieces as well. The studio membership for piano teachers is open on the 15th of March next year. Hop onto the waiting list now to make sure you receive your invitation at pianoteachingsuccess.com.
thank you, Paul. We've had a question from Kathleen Lawler who asks for ideas on how to teach a student who keeps forgetting the notes she has previously learned. What's happening when students um, can recognize notes on a flashcard, etc., but not within a piece of music? That is a very good question. Rebecca? Yeah. Um, so one thing I wondered about that question, can, when you say she can recognize them on the flashcard, is she able to play them on the piano? So I'm assuming she can. But yeah, I was thinking about that, thinking, well, when all those notes are in music, there's so much more for them to process. It can be a bit of an overload, can't it? Um, they're having to read for two hands. The notes are going all over the place. Sometimes there's chords. Sometimes there's a key signature, sharps to remember, flats to remember, or and also the rhythm. So I was thinking it's kind of similar to the first um, answer. I would say try and break it down for them and, and get them to do some really easy sight reading and practice the actual act of sight reading but in a really simple context break it down c position notes for a while g position notes and um, i've done that with students it's been really good so you know we set five or ten minutes aside to just actually sight read and then after a while i see it feeding into you know the more difficult music they're playing um, but i was thinking there could be other issues i don't know you'd um, all the students are different um, it could be just that maybe because they are reading slow they're only reading a small amount of music so they're actually not practicing reading music very much so giving them simpler music and getting them to do it while you're there that would help that sometimes if kids don't like reading music they'll try and memorize it really fast and then they'll memorize it wrong <laughs> mm -hmm. so that could be going on um i wonder you know she might be looking at uh, her hands and that can be uh, cause them to lose place and if you're not looking on the music that could be something so that's going on um, and if they're playing the simple pieces you could cover their hands just to get them in the the habit of reading the music and tracking with their eyes and then I thought she might be like one of my students who's just got her head in the clouds and it's she's just not concentrating most of the time and when I say to her come on just concentrate till you get to the end and when she actually does concentrate she plays really well <laughs> so she might be a bit like my student anyway these are just different ideas yeah. um, I hope some of them are useful yes very yeah. often uh, there's just so many um, answers to that quick possible yeah answer so many answers. but um, very often it's the cognition is it the speed of cognition which you, you were touching on isn't it that yeah. um, can they read is it no they're just going yeah that with a flashcard are they just yeah. identifying them verbally or are mm -hmm. they actually able to play them like we yeah. saw Chloe do and yeah. then are we then able to m move that you know like it was very powerful we saw Chloe take the note from the stave and stick it onto the actual keyboard note mm. that kind of that really linking and yep. you do an activity in the book that also try yeah. and does that too. So it's just, mm. yeah, and, and who knows? <laughs> Could yeah. be a myriad of other things too, as you said. That's right. <laughs> Rachel Soria asked, is this system just a system for teachers or is it something a parent can use to teach their own child? And how hard is it to teach? Oh, okay. I'll answer that question first. It's really easy. If you can tell a story, you can teach this. Mm. Um, and you'll probably learn at the same time Rachel. <laughs> um, the books are just very self-explanatory. Um, there is a little, oh, excuse me, I'm just going to grab a book. Um, there is a little explanation page at the front, um, but yes, definitely parents can be teachers. Um, yeah, very much so. the other question? <laughs> very pictorial. Oh, is it just something for teachers or is it something a parent can use? Oh, yeah. No, yeah. Yes. It is definitely something a parent can, can do with their child. Yeah, and um, as you say, if they go on and buy the board and have the board at home, yeah, um, that kind of extra, mm. more than just doing it once a week at your place. If they were mm. doing it several times a week at home as well, which mm. I think you said Chloe's mum has the board. Did you say that? Yeah, she does, and I think that's why Chloe is able to teach her little brother because yeah, they've got the magnets and everything at home. Yeah, 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 which is terrific. So if Chloe can do it, you can do it, Rachel. <laughs> We've had a lovely message in from Constance Kenny from Scottsdale in Arizona. Constance, let us know if you're with us live. It'll be nice. Um, who says, overall, I'm just interested in any new approach or improved approach to beginning reading. Well, that's, that's terrific. And that's what we're here today to do. 
Well, we've got some more footage of Rebecca teaching Chloe, and this time she's going to be teaching her some new notes. So yeah. let's go look at that now. Chloe is up to page 15 in Easy Notes Level 2. So we're going to tell some stories, and we need the mountain. Where does the mountain go? Good girl. And you already know one of the notes by the mountain, eh? It's Fly F. Put them on the mountain. Cool. Actually, can you put Fly F up on the stage? Good. So here we go. Behind Girl G's house is a beautiful mountain range called the Treble Mountains. High up on one of those snowy mountains lives a tough little goat, Mountain Goat G. Mountain Goat G is so tough because sometimes it gets very cold and she's just very happy on the very top of those mountains. I'm just going to give you Mountain Goat G and can you put her Standing on top of the mountains. Good girl. Even Fly F can't get that high, which is lucky for that goat. Here's Fly F flying on the top line, and he can't get as high as Mountain Goat G. So this is tough little Mountain Goat G standing on top of the mountains. Mountain Goat G is so high that above her is nothing but air. See all that air above her? Sometimes the air is clear and warm on sunny days. Sometimes it's windy and then when it snows the air is very cold and the, the air drops all the snow on the Treble Mountains. Yeah. It's as if you can see the air like a line above the Treble Mountains. So this is our new note, Air A, which is like a line above the mountains. So, yeah, so this is air A, because we can't really see air. And can you put it up here on this line above the mountains? It's like, it's like cat C. It is, isn't it? Yeah, it is. But cat C is down here and air A is up there. Yeah. That's cool. So, here's another story. In the nicest of times is when hot air balloons float, float high up in the air over the mountains. Although Mountain Goat G is usually too busy eating to notice. So here's lots of beautiful, beautiful balloons floating above Air A over the Treble Mountains. So I'm going to give you Balloon B. And can you make Balloon B? I know where he's going. Yeah. That's right. It floats above Air A. Very good. Very good. Okay, so now we're going to put them down on the piano. We'll read the story. The treble mountains are very high, soaring way up higher than Dad D's ladder here on the piano. Flies can't get that high, so Fly F flies around below the mountains. Can you put Fly F below the mountains? Mountain Goat G lives up on the mountains, high above Fly F. Put her above Fly F. She is so high that above her is nothing but air. Except on days when beautiful balloons float over the treble mountains. Cool, that's very good. So let's just practice these notes. I think we'll practice them down here on the piano first. So can you put Mountain Goat G in the right place? And Balloon B floats over the mountains. Now, where's ear A? And fly F can't get that high, can he? It's too high for him. So where's fly F up on Triple Stay Street? Can you put him in the right place? What about the balloons? No, no, no. I want you to put the balloon next. Where do the balloons go? And what about, yep, ear A? Like a line above the mountains. And mountain goat G. And, you know, sometimes you can put mountain goat G there. Look. There she is, standing up on one of the mountains. That's awesome. Good girl. So I'm going to give you the flashcards for those notes. And we'll um, add them to your pile. So I think you're going to have 27 notes now. Oh, that's good, that's good. Okay, so how about play these notes for me, okay? Yeah. By the mountains. Are you ready? Oh, I don't have play, but that's okay. Okay, play this one. Now who's that standing on top of the mountains? Good, yeah, yeah. What's that one? 
Good. It's floating above air, A. Eh? And what's that note? Well done. And remember, if you forget, you can look at the pictures on the back. Yeah, and Mum can read out some clues. So I want you to practice these at home with Mum, right? And then you can do those two Easy Notes pages that we read, okay? Mm. So, so when Chloe goes home, she's going to um, do page 15 and 16. She's going to practice naming the notes she's learned and drawing them as minims. And then um, sh here they are on the piano and she'll practice connecting those notes from the stave to the piano. And then she'll, we've added those notes to her flashcard pile and it's always her job every week to practice her flashcards with mum at home. Isn't it, Chloe? Good. <laughs> that's, that's very, that's terrific. And this is the first time Chloe's actually heard this story, right? Yeah, that, it is. But knowing Chloe, she's probably had a sneak peek and I heard her, she kept saying, Cloudsy, Cloudsy, that's the next story. Oh. Um, <laughs> she might have had a you. sneak peek, but that's all right, isn't it? We don't mind if they go ahead and do more theory than we ask them. Oh, exactly. Yeah, they just love it. They have that motivation. They, they just really love it. Yeah. yeah. And um, Ginny asked, are all the stories written out? Yes. So um, can I just take them through the books really quickly? Yeah. Um, so first of all, the books um, teach the notes on the piano um, with characters. And um, like there's six pages that do that. And um, first they connect them to this kennel. Um, oh, <laughs> where a dog lives, you know, with two black stripes. And then... then so they're counting up from the kennel all the time and then we start connecting them to a lily pad and so then they're able to know where all the notes are based on the two and three black notes. And then... Um, Let me interrupt you. So the lily pads and all of that kind of oh, stuff yeah. are in the middle. So you just tear them out. They're all perforated and things like yeah. that. So they come out of there. Yep. Yeah, made of card. And then um, by the seventh... And I usually just get them to do two pages a week. So now we're on the fourth lesson and we start learning notes on the stave. And they are taught just the same way that I taught Chloe, those upper ledger lines, just through stories and in hand position, uh, like I said to the other teachers. And it makes it really easy because you're just concentrating on a few notes at a time. And um, then after repetition, they just get to know them. And you're not talking about, I don't know, dog D or bug B anymore. They just know those notes. That's the power of the stories and the power of coming at it with all the different learning styles. So, yeah, all the stories are written out. out. It's all laid out. And there's lots of revision pages. Um, we're going... I think what I really like about the story is you've been really quite economical in the words, but you still yeah. get the meaning across. Like Absolutely. if I read them out, I'm going to read them out. Mountain goat G is so high that above her is nothing but air. That's exactly what um, yeah. what Rebecca was just saying. Sometimes the air is clean and warm, sometimes windy. So it's very, there's only about three lines of words, yeah. but it's very economical and very pictorial and, um, you know, makes our imaginations run wild. Because so. I, I know that piano teachers are busy because I am one. So I just put five minutes aside in the lesson for this um, and I just really watch the clock because um, they would do this the whole lesson if you let them <laughs> but yeah um, but five minutes and then we're on to the rest of the lesson which is just working through their lesson books playing music just a normal lesson so this is just like the theory component this is a theory book um, for beginners and it does like the most important thing a beginner needs which is to know what those notes are, just like when you send your kid to school, what are they going to be laboring on over and over and over in the first year? It's the A, B, Cs. So we just need to spend a little bit of time so they can absorb this and access it. Uh, so that's what these theory books do. Um, uh, yeah, so they go through, once they're learning notes on the stage, stave, it does all the C position notes, then it moves up to G, puts the G position, and then uh, the inner ledger lines and the outer ledger lines are covered in book two. Um, it also brings in sharps and flats, um, dynamics. Uh, oh, and at the back, there's a rhythm section. A lot of people were asking me, how would you teach rhythm? So I have a rhythm section. It's all kind of through stories. Um, and I, I just also wanted to say that, yeah, all those flashcards are in the middle. It's, I just think it's really good. Don't tear the whole lot at once. 
out at mm. once, just tear out the ones they know. Yeah, and then nice. on the back of the flashcard is all the pictures of each character and those clues. You know how I said you can say who's snug in the middle line, and then you can say who's on the middle line. So those clues are on the back and the parents can prompt them. Mm. And I think that when they hear those prompts, there's another learning style coming in, just strengthening the, the knowledge in their mind. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's how the books work. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Patricia Gunn asked, uh, may I know if both kits, big and small size, have the books included, are, yes. they, are they the same price? I think they're like slightly different prices, the, yeah. aren't they? And you can, yes, the kit has the board. So the small board, make sure you look at that, which one, whether you want the small board or the large board. In Australia, that's for America and I guess in New Zealand, but in Australia, we can only, we've only got one kit uh, and that's got the large board in it. It is great value. It's like about $150 worth of value for 120 minus plus the 10% discount. So it's great value. Um, but the yeah, our supplier only does the one the one kit at the moment. Um, so, but otherwise, you can buy all the individual parts separately, right? Yes, you can. If you lose start losing too many magnets, you can um, just pick up another sheet of character magnets or yeah, and more just, books. Yeah, if you lose yeah, some stuff. That's always good to do that. If with you the, vacuum one up, you know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And um, yes, the books are for sale as individual um, items. Mm -hmm. So yes, you buy the kit for you, which has your copy of the book in it, mm -hmm. and then you buy the extra yeah. books for the children because they need their own books at home. Yep, that's right. Yeah. And is the temp and you've got a special discount in the Wilbeck store. Can you tell us about that? Oh yeah, uh, Will dot com for for the USA and the rest of the world. Um, twenty percent off the kits at the moment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Um, and we've got a free gift for everybody. <laughs> Tell us about that. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I've selected some of the pages. So you can just um, download them and have a look. It's uh, the explanation page just talks a little bit about how it works. Um, two of the pages that teach the notes on the piano. Uh, the first note, the first page that teaches the treble clef on treble stave street. The first page that teaches a really cool note called football f on base day farm i really like that note it's a cool one um, because farmer fred see he kicks the football through the goalposts on the fourth line and um you know when you teach that on the piano well there's a, also a lily pad on the farm so sometimes farmer fred misses the goal and football f splashes under the pond into the pond and gets lost under this lily pad. So that's a really cool connection as well. Well, they're all cool connections. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they are all cool connections. Yeah. So just to clarify the discount, so Ginny, I don't know where you live, Ginny, but if you're in America, you're going to get 20% 20, 20 off the kits. If you're in Australia, you get, the kit is actually already 20% off because it's $149 worth of value for 120. And then you get an extra 10% off in our shop. And, um, but if you buy, even if you buy some books for your students and everything, you pay more than, if you spend more than a hundred dollars in the shop, you'll get 10% off everything that you, you buy of this range. And let's talk about the other little thing, which is, this is where I first came to see you. I saw this cute box and, um, and which has got full of magnetic notes. And I first saw this at Piano Pivot Live. In fact, I think I've seen this before, but I saw it again. Right. And remembered, oh, I really love these things. Yeah. At Piano Pivot Live. And um, oh, here they are. This, I, I feel the fine art. <laughs> and yeah. um, I, when I was a Yamaha teacher way long ago, uh, we used to have little uh, magnetic kits that the kids used to have. And I always thought, wow, this is a great thing to develop and have. And, well, you've just taken the whole idea to a whole new level. <laughs> <laughs> Thank so you. So tell us about we've got here. That, so these all actually fit on the stave, don't they? We even got yeah. bar lines. They, people ask me, do they work with both staves? Yes, they work with both staves. Mm -hmm. So I've got two sets of notation magnets of course they're black <laughs> um but we have um we've got notes we yeah we've got notes rests dynamics um sharps and flats time signatures um this is really great you can use it with your beginner students so they can like pick up a quarter note or a crotchet um i have one american lady told me her sight and paired student finds these really great because he can feel the notes mm, I thought that was very nice. tactile mm. and they can interact with music notation and it and have fun with it you know yeah, uh, yeah. 
and I like you can use if you've got like a grade five who has to know lots of key signatures you can get them interacting with where the sharps go um, so that's the notation side and of the magnets the other ones I've called matchup magnets and um, I really like these oh um, hang on a minute I'll get the other one so I've just chosen some like standard theory topics for example key signatures so here's some key signatures and they can just practice matching G C major G major A minor okay I knew I wouldn't be able to do this in front of everyone E minor yeah so they can match the key signatures and um, there's intervals we've got melodic and harmonic intervals so um, they can match that with the interval number that's so that's in this set, key signatures and intervals. Um, this one, note values and rhythms. So they can practice matching, um, you know, a semi-brief or a, a whole note with its note name and how many beats it has. Don't worry, those are wrong. <laughs> Don't test me on it. Um, and um, I have got the US names and also the UK names, which we use here, like crotchet and quaver. Um, and then this side is the mix match and clap rhythms i like this it makes rhythm really visual so here's a whole note or a semi breathe and you can get them to make up rhythms and then mix and match and then clap with them so that's another um another little activity you can do with them um you notice i'm using them on the back of the stave this side has got the stave and the side is blank um, you can get out your pen and write on it if you like, tick, 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 or whatever. Um, yeah, so, and then you can store them away in the boxes. The boxes come like this, and they've got magnets, and you just, you know, assemble them. Make your own box up, and it looks like this. Yeah. It's very lovely. Yeah. <laughs> And so you can get your the uh, Wilbix Theory resources from blackrockmusic.com.au in Australia. And in New Zealand, you can buy them from Piano Traders and Shearer's Music Works. And of course, in the US, we've mentioned before, it's Wilbex, W-I-L-B-E-C-K-S dot com. So, um, yeah, that's fantastic. And if you're in the UK, sorry, UK, we haven't done anything yet, but we're going to talk to Rick, Rick about that in a minute, about look, looking at um, blackrockmusic.co.uk. But um, Peter Simpson's Manumat system is available from blackrockmusic.co.uk and there's a giant staff which also can be a lot of fun too so that's also one of the ways you can use some sort of interactivity with mm. and some of these ideas you've seen today uh, just a quick reminder to make sure you go over to pianoteachingsuccess.com and grab your free gift from the show notes today and that's all we've had i mean it's been so such a busy day <laughs> that's all we've got time for today thank i'd mm. like to thank rebecca wilson for being with us today and we'll be back in two weeks' time for another great episode of Q&A. Remember, you can join our watch list and receive episodes straight to your inbox, or you can catch the replay in our Facebook group, Piano Teaching Success. In the meantime, there are three ways you can send us questions or ideas for topics. Um, you can send us an email, you can post it in our Facebook group, or you can ask the question button, um, click the Ask the Question button on our website, pianoteachingsuccess.com. I'd like to thank Paul Myatt, who's been producing today's show and is responsible for all behind-scenes tech. And we're going to go out today to the music of a 10-year-old Stella, who is Rebecca's student, playing a piece by Manfred Schmitz from the Trinity College Grade 6 uh, called Progression 1. On behalf of us, stay well and we'll see you in two weeks. Bye.